Yeah, it's starting to do uh, quite well here. Um, <laughs> that's just the gate closing. Uh, <coughs> I'm just wondering if we got peas and beans, uh, plants with long, persistent root hairs. Of course, in this uh, Dianeer paper here, they uh, actually mention um, long, persistent root hairs which is quite unusual, of plants growing in the wild. So these are plants that grow in the wild, have long persistent root hairs. And um, that's quite unusual, especially coming from botanists who start their uh, botany, or anatomy botany classes uh, with peas and beans, which have plants known to have long persistent root hairs, you see, you know, of that sort of size, you know, an inch and a half to two inches, if not longer. Uh, on them and uh, I'm wondering if this is all related sort of thing so we've got uh, you know peas, beans, tomatoes, long persistent root hairs, also plants that if you plant them deeply can actually develop uh, adv advantageous uh, uh, roots and root hairs uh, on, on their off the stem basically if you plant them deeply in the soil. Uh, I'm wondering if there's um because Peas and beans are known to use um, rhizobia. They have the uh, rhizobia uh, bacteria in their uh, in their nodules, and I'm wondering if and you can also have free living ones as well. I'm wondering if there's a way of actually getting free living ones to just amass along the root, um, the, the fine root hairs, and maybe form maybe even form micro nodules or something like that, or, or just amass along the. the you know, in, in a way like a, a mycorrhizal fungus forms a sheath, a, an, an ectotrophic mycorrhizae, um, you know, a macroscopic one, one you can see with the naked eye, uh, forms a, you know, a, a extended sheath along the, uh, the the root run sort of thing, but with the the, the, the fine um, persistent root hairs, you see. And uh, yeah, things like, and we've got, we've got other organisms out there too, like uh, Azotobacter, you know, particularly they talk about Azotobacter vinlandii. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering if, you know, we go from these things, uh, peas, beans, tomatoes, you know, and all these capsicums, you know, is there a way of making capsicum actually produce fruit in a single season if you get these sort of organisms to latch onto the roots and you can get that speed and growth, robustness, because I'm wondering if they, you can actually separate um, thriftiness from actual robustness. So you can actually have a, a spindly plant that's very um, thrifty, uh, but it's not robust. Um, and vice versa, you can have a, uh, a, ro a robust plant that's not very thrifty. And whether you can get the two together sort of thing. So you can have um, a thrifty, robust plant that's growing very fast and very robustly, you know, colourfully and uh, things like that. So uh, whether those two uh, concepts or entities can actually um, uh, are, are um, not necessarily mutually exclusive, they can work separately but and also in tandem if you have the right conditions, the right edaphic factors in the soil. But um, yeah, so, um, so we've sort of solved... Um, yeah, I'll just go through here. Yeah, so this is basically finished. They put down the uh, pave set uh, uh, yeah, it was just yesterday. So it should be set uh, at the moment. So I'll just do go back to normal. There we go. So they put down pave set in the uh, so it's basically they mix it with a bit of sand so basically and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, down the sides there, and uh, yeah. And he sort of smoothed out this a bit. I probably have to get the little electric chainsaw out for some of the excess roots here and there. But um, yeah, looks all right. He is right about the border. If the water had been on that side, it would make it look much smaller. So, oh, um, look at this. Got a hand to him. That's what he had left. So uh, his calculations were on the money, I would say. Yeah. Four big pavers and five grey pavers left over. 
So. So we basically come to some conclusions so I'm putting some in here I'm going to take time to take off but um, put some new ones in there oh yes I've got this idea I saw a bubble come up there did you see a bubble come up there yeah um, I think I worked out why it's always halfway up the pot the water level should be halfway up the pot they're using a different standard to peat and sand. Yeah. I believe that maybe this is the actual standard that they're using to get this idea about capillarity. You know, you've got to have the water level halfway up the pot to get the, the right, correct capillarity. They're not actually using peat and sand as their standard. And they're probably using something like this, if not this, as their standard, which is why you have to have the water level halfway up the pot. Yeah, so we sort of come to some sort of general clue. We know why these, all these sort of plants have to be permanently damp uh, to stop oxidation, basically. Um, why they have to be have good drainage so that the, the, the oxygen in the air can get down to the root zone. But it's, 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 because the soil doesn't oxidise, it doesn't take away that 20% um, oxygen that's in the atmosphere because there's 78% nitrogen in the atmosphere about 20% oxygen and, and, the, and the rest is CO2 and all the noble gases and things like that so uh, just say what I've noticed if we can get this in the sun there was a root down here on that um, typo daisy I don't know if I can get it round into the sun let me just put this uh, in there if we can get this round into the sun I might be able to show you this there's a root down there that's gone red all the way along the root run with this little fine root hair sort of thing. I'm wondering if that's part of the trick. Get the right conditions right and uh, it might, like, might be like peas and beans, you know. You can, you can ensheathe all those fine root hairs with some sort of nitrogen fixing organism. Um, it's like this thing, like this idea about these uh, soils, you know. You have clays, silts and sands we got this um, inc another incongruency in the in the field is you get you get your highest load or capacity of uh, nematodes in sandy soils where there's to a degree almost buggerable there <laughs> and you've got to ask yourself why do sandy soils have such a high or heavy load of nematodes in there? Of course, they always go on about good nematodes, bad nematodes. It's a bit like your yeah, osmocote stale eggs, osmocote stale Don't look at the liverwort sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I had to move that one over there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, these are starting to grow now. And, uh, oh, yes, the other thing. If you can see that with the, um, with the tomato seeding there, I've noticed they become... Um, immediately the, the red vein, uh, sorry, the mid vein went red and it's become more glandular. So, uh, yeah, so that's very interesting. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I'm still doing little little experiments at the moment to slowly dig myself out of the hole, but um, I think we're starting to do tick boxes and some of these ideas why they have to be permanently uh, damp, why you need good dra uh, drainage. Now we've got, maybe got this idea of why. The water level is always talked about in the thing of being halfway up the pot, you know? Uh, probably because they're using a different standard. So, um, and the other thing, we've got these ideas where they talk about, um, if I can, you know, just let me put it on the, on the bin here. You've probably seen this before, but if I get this out of the folder, there's this thing where they talk about this idea about Moorish heaths. I think we now got the idea that that basically means, doesn't mean strong, what it means is it's, uh, brown and black so uh, that's what it basically means so if we can get to the beginning when they talk about growing on more is here yeah, so there's the beginning of this um, whole thing I've had since the 90s basically went and dug this out of the basement the library let me see I'll make sure I am on spot colour yeah. otherwise it would be a waste of time so uh, yeah so you get your basic uh, stuff here and you can pause your lashes or thing. Yeah. 
So I've read this in different uh, ways. I've been read, read it backwards, and you have all your dialing. Like this was before we had the mobile phones, of course, when we found out that basically they're less than five miles from the open ocean, and it's very flat. So you know, all this idea, all this pushback against salty soils. So uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Oh, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna get there in a minute. So you, they pause this on your screen at your leisure. Hopefully it's picking all this up. It's pretty bright today. Oh, here we go. There's your Moorish Heaths. Being rich in quotes. Light black, brown on Moorish Heath. So a dark colour. So that, that, basically that means brown and black, basically. So you, you top here to Pui's in South America. They're black on the top and slightly underneath the back you see brown. So, uh, yeah. And in these sort of soils, they have, like there's coffee coloured soil underneath, so um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Maybe this is a better way. You can look, you can list papers online, you can find it, but you've got to get the right link to actually um, be able to look at it or to download it, sort of thing. It's an old paper. You know, they, they started work on it, I think, in 1953 and went through, and it was published in 1958. Robertson Oostings, according to Donald Snow, he just used to call them Oostings and Oostings, implying that they got married. So, you know, this is the late Donald Snow, he used to send me, we used to swap spoken word cassettes with one another. I've still got them. Same with other people. I've even got a tape in the, in the vault from the, the, the Plantastic Man over in Victoria. He sent me a, a, a tape. I sent him a tape and he sent me a tape. So I've got a whole tape of Mr. Plant. Mr. Plantastic talking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Gee, it doesn't seem like a long paper here, does it? Oh, of course, then they do soil studies so in the clay Leon. So, uh, never could work out what, why. I tried doing a lot of research to try and know what, what, what the, the actual terminology means. You know, when you're plumber soils and all sorts of other stuff, you know, all these. Uh, Rains and plumbers. I thought rain sounds very wet, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think it's spelled differently, so if, I, if I remember rightly. But uh, yeah. uh, there were three specific ones: plumber, rains, and something else. So uh, I think I'm missing one back page or something. It's probably it's in there. It's probably fallen off. Uh, but uh, anyway, and you, of course, then you got this sort of transect. Uh, and uh, what was interesting about all these plants up here, when I looked in my serpentine book. There was a hundred a hundred percent correlation between they either had a species in the same uh, um, uh, family or genus that was a uh, a, a known serpentine um, endemic. Um, yeah, sort of. It was very interesting. So I looked up these things, and all these plants had some had some reference of a plant in the back of my serpentine book. So just all of them. And I thought that's too much of a coronation. So they had a, either a relation somewhere to them of a known serpentine endemic. And I thought, nah, 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 not a hundred percent correlation like that. That's too much. That's not that's not a coincidence. So I think and there's some sort of biological um, thing going on. But as I said, we're slowly working this idea out that um, um, yeah, you might be able to actually just activate the plant sort of thing, a bit like, you know, um, so, so what, what I'm trying to say is you've got peas and beans, and they don't always necessarily grow um, well, um, something you've got to inoculate and things like that, and I'm saying there's probably a whole load of other plants out there with long persistent root hairs that um, only activate under certain soil edaphic uh, conditions or thing. So you've got to get them in the right soil, you've got to know what's going on. And it's, and it's related to all this, got to keep the soil damp, don't let it dry out. So it's related to lower forms of plant life like ferns. So you may be, because yeah, you have these difficult ferns, don't you? You have ones like staghorn ferns. They're always talking about putting a banana be uh, behind a staghorn fern to make it grow and I think it's um yeah they, they, there's more to it than that and I'm thinking you know they always talk about like in that old journal from the American um, Horticultural Society 
it, it, there's one paragraph in there when he basically says ferns will not grow without uh, leaf mold and you've got, you've got to ask yourself what is leaf mold what is leaf mold really when you really dig down to it so uh, yeah so um, oh, I think we'll slowly get have you noticed they've all gone red at the centre of the plant and go looking at um, see they've all gone yeah they don't look healthy from a distance, but when you get up close because of the, the way the soil is reflecting in the sunlight, it makes them look ill in a way. If you go there, they've got colourful, the leaf bases have gone sort of red sort of thing. So you've got to think about what would make the leaf bases go red. Do we have some organisms which are not only ensheeting the root run, but they're actually going inside the plant and into the leaf bases? So uh, yeah, so these things you've got to think about. They cleaned up a bit, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, ripped up a bit of the <laughs> bit of the soil. But they did clean up a bit, so and we had a bit of rain overnight, sort of thing. So uh, mm. yeah, this one's slowly getting a little bit more robust in there. But uh, the pots have been knocked around, as they say. Oh, and this thing, I don't know. You can see that in there, very purple, almost getting to a stage. In low light conditions, it almost looks black. So, uh, yeah. Oh, well, this is uh, seen you in there. Slowly making a move now, which is rather interesting. And my leaf cutting's still there and going red, so it might strike pretty soon. But, uh, yeah. Doing a lot of work, but I think we're slowly sorting out all the things. I said we've solved all these major problems, like why you have to keep it, why it's so important to keep these soils damp. Uh, why you need the, the drainage to get oxygen down there and the oxygen doesn't react with the soil now it, so in other words it, it's available for the roots you see so if you had it in a soil where it would it, it would react it would make the situation worse not better so uh, yeah so we're solving some of those major and of course now we've got an idea why all these books were saying setting the water level halfway up the pot Never really saying where did that come from and why to do that. But I think now, that's because they were or are just using a totally different standard as their baseline sort of thing. They're not using peat and sand as their baseline. Because if, you, if you've ever done that with peat and sand, it's a little bit too wet. So, uh, yeah. Oh, we got our first few flowers coming out. Oh, nice one. Yeah, that one's come back over there. It plants like this that go red in the center. These, they're the, um, oh, what is it? I've forgotten what it is, stackies or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Let's go for spot colour, don't we are on spot colour. So we got the original yellow one, then we got uh, then we had the pink one, which came in and, and slowly went white over about a ten-year period. The, the original uh, true uh, Oxalis capensis from South Africa slowly lost its pink flowers, and you got all these Mendelian um, whiter versions that took over, sort of thing. So uh, yeah. Anyway, and then we got this other one here now. Uh, which I think has small pink flowers, but we'll wait till it flowers and find out. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, nice scores, sunny day again today. It was supposed to be raining. It did rain a bit last night, but not that much. Yeah. I think that's what they're doing. They, they got rid of so many people in the weather stations that we're left with this degree of uncertainty. They say it's going to rain and you're never quite sure if it, what they say is true or not. And then we've got this uh, environment of fear as well. So you've got fear and uncertainty. You know, two toxic uh, <laughs> entities running back to back basically. But uh, as you can see, uh, this coming week, this should come into full bloom. This, uh, I don't even see this. We'll just go, can you see it from the, uh, from the other side of the road? absolutely magnificent and it's probably time for me to go and feed the birds uh, yeah. 
Uh, very, very tall, but they only last about 10 years. So uh, it's a black wattle with a photosynthetic stem. So. Anyway, that's about it for this one. Hope you enjoyed. Good read for you. If you've never read that paper, it's a good read. It, that one's been rep reproduced roughly uh, some of the guts, but they, they, they missed them in the uh, Dianeer book. But they missed the most interesting...